welcome to our session on making sense of our senses. Uh, lots of the children and young people that we journey with uh, that have additional needs, particularly, uh, in, uh, the sensory aspects to a lot of them. And so we're going to explore our senses a bit more this afternoon. Uh, we're going to look at the senses that we know a bit about. And I'll introduce you to some senses that you might not know so much about. And we'll also have uh, a little stop by uh, sensory processing differences as well. Uh, and all of that can be children and young people with different additional needs. I think I probably just said what's going up on the screen next, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but like you, I've just had lunch too, so my head's still full of you know, all the stuff from food. Uh, but, um, for those of you that have got a book or can see a book, uh, there are the slides in, in there too. This is actually an uh, extract from a much uh, longer two, two, two and a half hour training session. So not everything that's in the book will pop up on the screen. Uh, there'll be some key things up there for us to have a look at. Remember to mention questions there. Ask questions as we go to. If you've got a question, then stop me uh, and ask. Uh, but we will try and make sure there's a few minutes for any questions left at the end. Is that okay for everybody? Those of you that were, hands up those of you, there's a few of you that were at my session earlier today. Yes. Uh, those of you at my session earlier today will know that I've also brought with me an all day lock in study on the Vitical Law. So, you can see that. There's one or two of you going to sleep. No, there was a session on that. <laughs> those of you that were at my session earlier will also say, be uh, aware that I bring my fidget box with me wherever I go. Uh, and so my fidget box can make its way round, and you can have a, a look at that. Um, quite heavy. Let me put it here, and then you can take something from uh, there, and then it can pass its way uh, around as well. We're sensory creatures. And that's what this session is all about. And as sensory creatures, we have a, uh, a need sometimes to fidget and fiddle with things. Uh, you might be a doodler. Uh, you might pick up a pen, you, you might chew things. Uh, you know, we, we all doodle and fidget with things in different ways. Uh, my son, James, who's autistic and has learning difficulties and a range of other additional needs too, uh, he loves to squeeze and squish things. So they quickly learn at my church, down in Bournemouth, not to stick posters and notices up on the wall using blue tap. Because they find them scattered across the floor and James wandering off, squeezing a big handful of blue tack uh, that he gathered for himself. So, uh, as sensory creatures, you know, we, we need things to help us to concentrate and focus, and especially after lunch. Uh, so my fidget box can find its way around and you can have a play uh, with the things that are there. So, what we're going to do for each of the senses that we're going to have a look at, a bit of an introduction, a bit of what we can do to support children and young people with a range of additional needs that might um, uh, be impacted in one way or another by uh, that particular sense being uh, impaired or not having that particular sense. Uh, and, uh, and then there's something to hand around or play with uh, to help to uh, understand that a bit more. We're starting with sight. Usually, if we ask people uh, a sort of straw poll of, uh, you know, to name their, their, their senses, most people start with sight. It's often thought of as you know, the most uh, sort of important of our senses. Actually, there's lots of senses that are important, but people often think about sight first. And of course, we use it as a little picture there shows us. Those of you at the back may not see this so well, but if you've got the book there, you can see it too. We use it to detect motion to find things. Um, I had uh, laughingly earlier on, I uh, managed to put my clicker down here. There's a black clicker on a black chair. And then I couldn't find my clicker. And I was looking everywhere for it. And then I came over here to something else and locked it on the floor. Like, what was that noise? It was my clicker. Um, so, um, so actually, I use several of my senses to find my clicker in here. But um, we use our sight for that. We use it to uh, tell different colours. And we use it to recognise different faces, to, to recognise people. Some uh, children and people in, in adults can have uh, something called face blindness, which means that uh, they might meet somebody that they know ever so well, but they won't recognise them. They can't um, uh, detect from their face who they are. And of 
course, we might have a child or young person or even a leader in our children's and youth work um, who's blind, so they've, lost, uh, they've either not ever had their sight or they've lost their sight or they have a, um, a, a visual impairment. Um, we can think about how to include them. A really important thing is to speak to them clearly and to use their names uh, so that they know that we're talking to them. Uh, a friend of mine, Philippa, who was born blind, uh, she says that sometimes when she visits other churches, her own church is great for welcoming her, but sometimes when she visits other churches, um, they don't say hello to her when she arrives. And so she's not quite sure, you know, when has she got there? You know, is this the entrance? Uh, where does she go? Because they don't necessarily welcome her and, and, and use her name because they don't know her. If appropriate, we can use different resources to support children or young people or adults um, who might be blind or have a visual impairment, maybe large print or braille. If you're looking for uh, those sorts of resources, then um, Torch Trust are a really great place to get those sorts of resources from. They provide um, Bible, song books, prayer books, all kinds of resources in large print, um, braille, uh, audio formats, all kinds of uh, ways to, uh, to, to resource it with that. But ask uh, a, a child or young person that might need those resources, what they need, uh, and then provide them for them. Also, uh, if you're putting things up on the screen, as I am here, try and use a, a nice clear font, a good contrast between the, the font and the background. You can see I've gone for white on uh, blue here. Different people will prefer different things with, with a visual impairment, so ask them what works for them. Uh, white on blue you know, works for lots of people, but not necessarily for everyone. Uh, so ask what, what might be helpful for them. Uh, and also do a little bit of a check around to make sure that there are no hazards. Uh, hazards can be obvious things like trailing cables or tables that are uh, stuck out, but also signs that stick out from the wall can be a problem. Uh, even glass doors that don't have anything on them uh, can uh, just appear like uh, an extension of a corridor that people can walk into. Uh, so all kinds of, of issues there. Uh, with, with our um, practical example for, for sight, I'm going to send around my, uh, my simulation. Uh, you can have a play with my simulation pack as we're, as we're talking. Uh, I'll give it to you first of all. Uh, uh, you might also need the notes there when you have a look. There's an extra copy of the workbook. So, if anybody's still looking for a workbook, anybody need a workbook back there? Spare one here? Yeah. One happy to be in the, uh, in the pad. Um, so, uh, Visual Impairment North East do a simulation pack that uh, helps us to understand different forms of visual impairment. Quite a good thing to uh, help children and young people to understand as well. So as the pack comes round, you can have a play, put different glasses on and see uh, what it can be a little bit like to have different kinds of visual impairment or sight loss. So that's sight, our uh, most known uh, of our senses. Hearing. Uh, we use our uh, auditory sense for all kinds of things, don't we? We use it to uh, determine what direction things are coming in to distinguish between different uh, things that are, uh, are making a noise. Gauge the importance of sounds, like a horn or something. Do you know that thing where if uh, an ambulance or police car is coming towards you, the sound gets higher and higher and higher pitched as the sound waves compress, and then as it's going past and heading away from you, it drops and drops as the sound waves stretch. If you have a child or a leader in, in a group who's deaf with a capital D, uh, that means that they've never heard, uh, so they were born deaf. Um, if they're deaf with a small D, uh, that means that they may have uh, heard but have lost their hearing, uh, uh, or they may have experienced a partial hearing loss. Uh, do they use sign language? Uh, if somebody has been born deaf, uh, then their first language is likely to be British Sign Language, BSL. Uh, whereas if somebody has lost their hearing, they're likely to lip-read, they may use some speech, uh, they may use some signing, uh, but they're predominantly going to use a blend of different forms of communication. Children and young people may use some Makaton. Uh, if you've not come across Makaton, uh, you might have come across uh, on children's TV uh, programmes like Something Special or Justin's House or those sorts of programmes where he uses Makaton there. 
if somebody lip reads, really important that they can see our faces. Uh, so to make sure that we're looking at them when we speak, that we're not you know, mumbling through our hands, uh, that we haven't got a window behind us that might put our face into shadow. So that can be an issue too. Can we make what we are doing more visual? So that you know, the more visual we make something, uh, the more helpful it is for a child or a young person who might be deaf. Well, Hans Veer defenders around right, so that you can kind of play with these. Uh, and a, a couple of pairs in here. Um, perhaps if you could pass them back for us, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Now I'm playing with those. Pass them on as well. Find okay. their way around. That would be great. Um, <laughs> they are technically children's ear defenders, but you can extend them out a bit, and they do fit most people that way. Let me show you. Uh, so you can pop them out and then open them up like that. Uh, then uh, you can put them on and try them out. And of course, it's in fact hard to have a conversation with you got some ear defenders on. Uh, but of course, ear defenders are a really useful tool for a, a lot of children and young people you might find loud noise over the So it's really uh, important that we have ear defenders around so that if a child or young person is struggling, that actually they're able to put some ear defenders on and be protected from the loud noise that they might otherwise be experiencing. Smell. One of our senses is our sense of smell. Um, the, the, the little cartoon for this has a, a lovely smell, uh, the little girl that's sniffing the flower, but also in the background behind her on the other one, there's a dog too. <laughs> Probably one of the nastiest of smells, isn't it? Uh, but of course children and the leaders may experience sensory overload when there are strong smells around. And different people can be uh, triggered by different strong smells. Yeah. Now, personally, I, mean, I really struggle with uh, the smell of coffee. Uh, so, uh, if I go into a coffee shop uh, to buy some tea <laughs> or hot chocolate, um, then um, uh, you, know, you have to approach where the coffee machines are. And so I try and you know, time it so that there's not a queue, because it really, you know, I really struggle with the smell of coffee. Sometimes I'll be stuck behind somebody, you, 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 hopefully this is to be it, but uh, one, of those, one of those people that spent about like half an hour just finding their coffee when they want so different smells can be uh, triggers to different people. Um, we're going to, a bit later on, start to talk a bit more about sensory processing difficulties. And we've got a little character here. Um, I know you won't be able to see all the small print that's on here. These are all different aspects of sensory processing difficulties, differences or difficulties of sensory processing disorder, as it says on the uh, picture. Um, but here, he says, I'm always smelling people, food, and objects. So he's got an underdeveloped sense of smell. And because he has an underdeveloped sense of smell, he's trying to get that sensory input. Uh, and by smelling things, he's, he's trying to, to meet that sensory need. Uh, but he could have an overdeveloped sense of smell, in which case some smells might uh, be really difficult, might be something to gag, or be really uh, overwhelmed uh, by that sense. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't like it because it smells too strongly. Uh, you know, so, so different smells, uh, and so different smells can be attractive to people, but also unattractive. Uh, like I say, coffee, strong perfume, you know, I can struggle with, but uh, it could be a strong smelling cheese, and I'm in heaven. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that's all good. Uh, I'm going to pass around uh, some uh, essential oils uh, for you to have a play with. Uh, Please start off at the back. Could you possibly, sorry, you could be my assistant for the whole thing. So there's some uh, essential oils that can start at the back. Uh, uh, there's a cheat sheet on the back in bed, uh, but see if you can guess what some of them are uh, as they come out. They're all nice. There's nothing nasty. <laughs> <laughs> really nice essential oils. Not like the 
There's no trick ones in there. Um, uh, you might have to sort of yeah. tip them out uh, if, if you need to. Do you mind? There's lavender in there. Yeah, that's yeah. a really strong one. There is lavender. I'm allergic to lavender. Lavender, bergamot, citrus, you know, there's all nice stuff. I'm not allergic to lavender. So, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, ever since I was little, I've never really liked coffee. Uh, and the smell of coffee. And, yeah, really hard. And, yeah, lots of people have different things for them. It's that smell that you can't, can't like. You know, other people, the smell of coffee is wonderful. We love it. So it's different. It's just slightly, or does it affect you more than just more slightly? And, I mean, it's a strong dislike, uh, so you know, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to spend too long next to one of those big coffee machines that I'd start to feel a little bit queasy uh, if I was there too long. So yeah, it can start to affect me in that way. So when I do get there and get my cup of tea, I go and find a quiet corner as far away as possible from the machine. <laughs> Taste, our, our sense of taste, there are all kinds of different uh, tastes, uh, sensations of that. So here, for those of you that can't see this, there are sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami, which is savoury. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, our little character here uh, indicates what should, where the food should be ingested. Sometimes, don't be, well, I say we, I do, I hope you all maybe do this, you take something out of the fridge, might be a day or two over its date. What do we do? Give it a bit of a sniff, don't we? Give it a bit of a sniff, and then we might give it a taste and see. Yeah, that's that's okay. Uh, I can still eat that. Uh, that's that's all right. Uh, some children and young people will uh, uh, put things in their mouths to explore them. So there's a condition called pika. Uh, pika doesn't stand for anything. It's not an acronym. It's actually part of the Latin name for the magpie. Uh, because um, often uh, people with pika can put things in their mouth and sometimes swallow them too. Uh, and uh, obviously for children and young people we have to be vigilant about that because it could be something dangerous or a, um, a choke hazard for them. Uh, my son James uh, has undiagnosed pika. You know, he's never really got a formal diagnosis for it but he's always putting things in his mouth and exploring. Um, Bruce alert, just so that you're aware before I leave. <laughs> when he was small and in sort of reception year one, that kind of thing, um, we'd always get a pretty good idea of what he'd been doing a day or two later, <laughs> if you get what I mean. Uh, there'd be sand or there'd be glitter or you know, that sort of thing, uh, because he'd have put it in his mouth and swallowed it. So, um, yeah, we just have to be aware of that, making sure that uh, they um, uh, aren't choking or at risk. They might seek out certain tastes and certain flavours. Others might make them gag. Uh, so it's important to understand their sensory profile. Here's our little sensory processing differences guy or difficulties guy. I'm a picky eater. I resist new foods and textures. So he may have an overdeveloped sense of taste which means that taste can be overpowering and so he picks certain flavours that he's in hope with uh, but uh, he gets others whereas uh, this, this alternative to that may chew on everything means an underdeveloped sense of taste uh, and therefore is desperate to try and find out what things taste like uh, by putting them uh, in their mouths. Now I've got some, uh, some things for you to, uh, to try out if you would like to hear as well. Uh, great excitement from my uh, friends here who can see those. Uh, so those are the uh, sour snakes. Uh, oh, this is nice. We've also got some nice uh, sweet uh, snakes in there as well. Uh, so, yeah. uh, if anybody's reading yeah, we'll them. these <laughs> are one. salted licorice and chili. Oh, and chili? So, if you really want to smell the salt, that's what it is. And there's those, and those are coming around, and you can try out those. Yeah, it's salted. It's really salted. Yeah. It's really Finally, on our, our, our five uh, senses that we know the most about uh, is our sense of touch. Uh, again, some children or uh, leaders even may seek out touch sensations. 
maybe things that uh, people find enjoyable. You know, most of us like to sort of stroke a soft toy or something like that. It's got a pleasing touch sensation, isn't it? Uh, so uh, we can do that. Um, the um, labels here, for those of you at the back that, that can't see this, um, there's some finger painting going on. Um, our sense of hope gives us the ability to feel pain. Uh, or to sense the world through the things that we touch it, or to know if it's hot or cold, or to, well, they're having a high that it says to differentiate the tactile qualities of the object. But, <laughs> those of you that might remember sort of Star Trek The Next Generation and Data, that might be the kind of way he described a hug. <laughs> tactile qualities of the object. Uh, but uh, yeah, we use our sense of touch in lots of different ways. Here's our little character again. Um, here he's saying, I seem to be unaware of normal touch or pain, and often touch others too softly or too hard. So uh, an underdeveloped sense of touch could mean that a child or a young person hurts themselves but doesn't realise it. So if we're doing something in our club like cooking, uh, where we might be using knives, or we might be using an oven, or something like that. Uh, then we need to be even more vigilant than usual uh, for a child or young person um, who may have an underdeveloped sense of touch. They may not realise that they've cut themselves or hurt themselves. Uh, similarly, uh, they might uh, be yeah, uh, too uh, physical uh, with another child uh, and not realise that they're actually hurting them, uh, using too much force to, to, to hug them or grab them or whatever it might be. Uh, they're, they're not able to distinguish that they're using uh, too much uh, force there. And to explore our sense of touch, um, there's uh, uh, something you can you can try. Uh, uh, it might be something to try later uh, because we're quite a full room. But at the back of the room, uh, if, if, if anybody at the back of the room you just hold up my two buckets. Um, so we've got a bucket that's got water beads in, and we've got a bucket that's got gum in. Uh, we've got the crystals. It's jelly bath. I've bought jelly bath. So, those of you that are at the back can have a go at that. Um, and then, if anybody wants to wander back and have a play, uh, then do please do that. Okay, maybe uh, you could do a little bit more wander around and, and try some of the things at the back uh, whilst also listening to the video. Uh, we've got a video now just for a, a few moments, and the video is some school children. They happen to be American school children talking up to their teachers about the things they'd like their teachers to know about. There's some sensory stuff going on in what they share. Uh, and they also share about how their teachers can support them better. So there's some learnings about sensory stuff in that as well. So uh, you can watch the video, you can go and put your hand in a bucket of gum, uh, whichever, or do both at the same time. Uh, but uh, let's have a couple of minutes uh, of listening to uh, these children sharing uh, their accounts as well. Dear teacher, I know it doesn't always seem like it, but I really do want to listen and learn. Just my brain is kind of it. So this is what I'd like you to know about me. I have to move, or I really can't pay attention. Even though I'm not looking at you, I can still listen to what you're saying. If you tell me, sit up straight, now I have to use all of my brain to do just that. It makes me feel sad when you tell me to try harder, even though I've already tried as hard as I can. I actually listen better when I'm rocking in my chair. When you give me a bunch of directions, I start to think, I will never remember all of this. So here's how you can make me out. Let me get up and move while I'm moving. Let me look wherever I want when you talk to me. Let me rock 
or slouched in my chair. Please don't take away a recess. Just ask me, what does your brain need right now? And one more thing. My brain might be different than yours, but it's still amazing. Sincerely, your student. Your student. Your student. Your student. Great kids, aren't they? Yeah, all sorts going on there that they share with us and help us to uh, understand today. Um, but there are some sensory things in there, and some of those sensory things we're going to come on to in just a moment, like why a child might need to get up and move uh, while they're learning, or why they might need to rock uh, in their chair, and those sorts of things. Before we get to that, um, just uh, one more thing to uh, hand around for now. Switch on the water spray. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, start this off here, uh, and I can head its way around. It's a sensory story box. Uh, and the sensory story box is all about God making the world. Uh, it's about the sun, and about the rain, and about the wind, and the storms, and uh, the ice and snow. And, and so we've got a torch for the sun, and we've got a palm spray for the rain. We've got a bit of electric fan for the wind, and we've got an ice pack for the ice and the snow. It's not very icy now, but you know, it could be if it was in the freezer long enough. And we've got a tambourine or a thunder stick for the thunder and rain. Making the things that we share with children as long as sensory as possible helps them to be able to engage with those things better. Uh, and so that's just one example of a sensory story box. Uh, if you make the things that, uh, that you're sharing with children as multi-sensory as you can, uh, then uh, that can really, really uh, help them to engage with the matter. Well, I think the vine simulation package has done the rounds. Did, did you not have a go? Okay, thank you. Head back and uh, have a look at that as well. Whilst that's uh, still going around, and whilst the Century Story Box is starting to go around, we're going to start to think about some of our lesser known senses that we don't know so much about. And we're going to start with our vestibular sense, our sense of balance and movement. Uh, the little pictures here uh, is talking about our sense of balance, our body movement through space, so knowing where we are in space. Uh, we're talking about maintaining our head and body position. So standing up from this is all our vestibular system. Determining direction and speed of movement. So when we suddenly stop and change direction, it's our vestibular system that helps us with that. Uh, and a lot of it is related to our inner ear. Um, so sometimes uh, if you've had an inner ear infection or a bad cold and it's affected your inner ear, it may have affected your back, but that's made it hard for you to, to sort of, you know, might feel giddy when you get up and, uh, and your, your sense of balance is a little bit off. Um, this is all our vestibular system. For each of these uh, next three senses that are going to explore, we've got a little cartoon that goes with it. In this case, chapter four is elephant to the vet. Uh, the elephant's upside down, uh, and uh, the vet says it might be using your ear. It could well be. Um, but you can, uh, and children and young people can have an under response or hyposensitive vestibular system, which means they need to move constantly to get that sensory input they're looking for. So when a child or young person is getting up and running around, sometimes you might have a child that runs around in the room uh, or walks in their chair and can't keep still in their chair, it could be they have an under responsive vestibular system and they need that sensory input. They need to know where their, uh, where their body is located in space and what way up they are and, and all the things our vestibular system is telling us. And so they move around to get that sensory input that they're looking for. Or they might have an overly responsive or hypersensitive vestibular system, which might mean that they're fearful of movement. They may get travel sick, for example. If you've got a child or young person who gets travel sick a lot, my daughter Phoebe, um, she's, she's a lot better now, but when she was a, a younger girl, <coughs> excuse me, she would get travel sick all the time. Uh, whether it was in a car or a boat or a plane, um, you know, she'd be the one that would be sat at the front with the bowl <laughs> and really, really struggling. She doesn't have to do that so much now. 
uh, but if you've got a child or a young person that has that over-responsive vestibular system, they, uh, they might feel uh, a little bit unsteady. They may not like games where you're running around and changing direction uh, a lot, because uh, that can be a, a real nightmare for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah. all of our senses are linked. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. all the ones we've got to tap to that we're going to come on to, others that I'm going to talk about today, all of our senses are linked. And uh, they all communicate through our, uh, uh, through our nervous system, uh, to our brain, and to uh, and get them receive information back as well, um, and they're all interrelated. So you can you can have under or over develop different senses, but they all they all work together uh, and, uh, and and relate to each other. For those of you that were in my session this morning will have seen my uh, my wobble cushion and balance board. Uh, so uh, I'll send these round uh, for you to have a look at. So the, the wobble cushion is something to sit on. Uh, and if you sit on the wobble cushion, you can wobble on it. You can wriggle and squirm, but you don't fall off your chair. Uh, the, um, the balance board, uh, the management accepts no responsibility for injury or loss <laughs> to anybody that stands on it and falls off. Uh, but, uh, here we've got uh, a little guy sat on a ball cushion, uh, there's a girl sat on a gym ball, there's a lad on a, a, a different kind of balance board. Um, sometimes a, a child or a young person that needs to move, equipping them with something like that can really help, especially the ball cushion. Uh, that's a great addition to the kids because you can move, you can wriggle around, uh, but you don't fall off your chair or break your chair, so that really, really helps.